Well, for 10, 11 weeks now, I've spoken on the theme, the series, Discovering God. And we've looked at 10 individuals who had a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus, with God. This morning, we're going to discover God, the Holy Spirit, and a personal encounter with the Holy Spirit who gives us the power of God to live our faith effectively. So two scriptures this morning. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, and then put a marker in your Bible in Matthew chapter 3. Just those two verses. Uh, We'll look at several other scriptures this morning, but in particular, those two. Lord, I do need the equipping of the Holy Spirit now. And so I'm asking, Lord, for clarity of mind. I'm asking that you'll help me to know where to pause. You'll help me to know where to park. You'll help me to know where to move on this morning as I go through what I believe, Lord, I'm confident you've given me this truth for this morning. You've affirmed that in so many ways. And so I give you thanks for that. But help me now to do justice to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I think you're going to like the message this morning. We're going to talk about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And I'm emphasizing the word in the Holy Spirit because a lot of people have referred to that incorrectly as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There is a difference, and you will see that this morning. Three points in the message. I'll go through these quickly, and then I'm going to go through one, two, and three, and we'll spend most of our time on point three. The Holy Spirit baptizes us into Jesus Christ. Number two, the disciple baptizes us in water, and then Jesus baptizes us in in the Holy Spirit. Those three things this morning. So here's point number one. The Holy Spirit baptizes us into Jesus. Into uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, for by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body. And if you go back and look at verse 12, you'll see that that is Jesus is the body. So when we get saved, the Holy Spirit immerses us into one body, the body of Christ. And it's the word baptizo. The word baptizo, you've heard me teach this before, but the word baptizo means to be immersed in. It, uh, the Greek word that's used there was a word they used that described the dying of a piece of material. Uh, they would take a piece of cloth and dip it in to dye blue color, red color, orange, green, whatever. They dip it in and then it would come out a totally different color. Now, this morning, uh, this sweet lady talked about a comment that was made in conference. One of the women, there was a question answer session that took place after these two men had taught about the importance of us getting back to teaching holiness in our churches. And there was one young lady that came and they were talking about the importance of language that we used to describe the experience and helping people to get into a lifestyle of holiness. And this lady came and she said, our church, uh, the theme of our church is come as you are. And her emphasis was come as the way you're dressed. You can dress any way you want to. You can come any way you are. Just come as you are. How do we teach that to the next generation? And the gentleman who had taught the lesson that morning wisely said, it's okay to come as you are, but don't leave the way you came. Come as you are. When the Holy Ghost comes in your life and you're baptized into the body of Christ, you go away a different individual. You go away changed like that dye that's baptized into the, into, uh, like a piece of cloth that's dyed into the dye or dipped in the dye. It comes out totally different color. That happened for me October the 31st, 1966. In case you forgot, that's when I got plugged in. That's when I got immersed by the Spirit into the body of Christ. 
And I changed to my life was transformed. I was taken out of the kingdom of darkness and was immersed into the kingdom of God's own son, the kingdom of light, and it became such a joyous walk. Okay? Now I came this morning, I said, Lord, I, I know I need to teach this morning, so help me to stay on target, because this is a little different territory, and I know some of you would come from all different kinds of backgrounds, and I thought to myself, isn't it ironic that the devil who hates the work of God so much has caused so much confusion on the subject of the spirit-filled life. If there's anything the devil hates, it's the spirit-filled life because it's what disrupts and destroys the kingdom of darkness. And so the devil has tried to give us all kinds of crazy ideas about the spirit-filled life. I had a pastor friend who told me, he said, there were only two holiness churches in the little town where I grew up. And he said, one of them, the women wore way too much makeup. And the other one, they didn't wear near enough. And he said, as a kid growing up, I thought to myself, either way, I'm going to have to marry an ugly woman. <laughs> well, there's a lot of confusion about being filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's not something that's weird or crazy. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more as we move along through the message this morning. But it's not weird. It's Bible. It's yeah. God's holy word. And we need to be, we, I'm going to say it, let me say it a little stronger. We must be immersed in the Holy Spirit and filled with the Holy yeah. Spirit. Now, point one, this is not being baptized in the Holy Spirit. This is be the baptism of of the Holy Spirit. Totally different. And you'll see that as we move through the message. Point number two. The disciple, the believer, baptizes in water. Matthew 28, 19. You're all familiar with that. Go therefore, Jesus said, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them, in other words, immersing them in water, in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. We got immersed somewhat this morning coming in, didn't we? I, I said to Doc, I said, I baptized you a few weeks ago, but you got immersed again this morning when you come in in the weather here. But the disciple baptizes us in water. Now, point number three. Let me move on. Matthew 3, 11. I told you to turn there because I want you to see this in the Word. John the Baptist is teaching here, talking, and he says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he, that's speaking of Jesus, he, the Messiah, who's coming after me, is mightier than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. He'll baptize you into the Holy Spirit or with the Holy Spirit. Now, a couple things I need to say here. John the Baptist, some people have said, well, the baptism in the Holy Spirit was for the disciples alone or maybe for the 120. Let me just remind you, when Jesus is coming to be baptized, he has not yet called the 12. That comes in Matthew chapter 4. And the 120 are brought into the kingdom a whole lot later on. So this is not talking about that particular group of people. It's talking about everybody. He said, when the Messiah comes, he's coming after me, and I'm not worthy to even touch his sandals. But he said, he, when he comes, his ministry, the ministry of the Messiah, is to immerse you in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. So it's for everybody. It's not just for the 12. It wasn't just for the 120. It's not just for preachers. It's for everybody, right? Yes. Amen. <laughs> Little ones and big ones, it doesn't matter. It's for everybody. So, Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Now, next slide. Now, I put it in, in, in some dots here to help us see. Uh, that there are three New Testament baptisms. I am visual. It helps me sometimes to see stuff visually. The Holy Spirit baptizes us 
into the body of Christ. That's when you get saved. He baptizes you into the body of Christ. The believer's baptism is a baptism that's done by a pastor or it could be a believer. It doesn't have to be a pastor. can baptize you in water. Now listen, some have questioned that and they've said it's a symbol only. Well, it is a symbol, but it's more than a symbol. If you understand baptism, it's a cutting off of the past. It's a cutting off of the flesh. When Israel went through the Red Sea, they left the enemy behind them. It cut off the enemy and they never saw them again. They were different people. They lived a new life after that. So when you get baptized, 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 whatever you want to call it, when you get it, it makes a difference in your life. Amen? And then Jesus baptizes us with the Holy Spirit. He baptizes us in the Spirit, with the Spirit. Now, let me say this. When we talk about the Holy Spirit, he is not an it or a thing. He's a person. And you need to understand that because you can't have a person with an it or a thing. But you can't have a, per have a personal relationship with a person. The Holy Spirit is a person. And you need to have a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit. Okay? Everybody with me? Say amen. amen. All right. Good. Good. I'm glad you're there. Let me find my notes and see where I'm supposed to be here. Okay. Now... Here's what I want you to see also this morning. The scripture says in Ephesians 4 that there's one baptism and one spirit. So some people who don't believe in this necessity of being filled with the Holy Spirit said, well, it's not biblical. The Bible says there's one spirit and one baptism. Okay, let me talk to you a minute about that. It also says there's one Lord and there's three Lords in one the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But let me help you a little more. Even people who believe that there are not three baptisms believe in two. They say we just believe in one. No, the ones that teach that also believe in water baptism. And so I'm saying this morning there are three. Now, theologically, that's true. But I want to show you something else. Grammatically, it is also impossible that it can be just one baptism. What are the subjects in each of those works? The Holy Spirit is the subject of that statement. The Holy Spirit baptizes into the body of Christ. The believer is the subject of the one who baptizes in water. Jesus is the subject of the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. So grammatically, they cannot be the same. The subject is different. The one doing the baptizing is totally different in each of those, those situations. So they're separate. They're distinct baptisms that take place. There are three New Testament baptisms in the New, in the New Testament. Okay? Now, something else I want to tell you. This is in all four Gospels. Very few things are in all four of the Gospels. But this truth is in all four Gospels. I'll show them to you in just a moment. But why, why is that true? Why is that important? Well, several reasons it's important, but you need to understand this. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called synoptic Gospels. And they cover primarily the third year of Jesus' ministry. They make a few statements about his birth, and then they all say, and John the Baptist was beheaded. And then they talk about things that happened after John was beheaded. John comes along in 70 AD or so, and John says, well, nobody wrote about the first and the second year of Jesus' ministry. And so the Holy Spirit inspires John to write about the first second year of Jesus' ministry, and also the third year of his ministry. That's why you find things in John that you don't find in any of the other Gospels. The wedding at the feast uh, 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 where, where Jesus turned the water into wine, uh, 
John chapter 3, you'll find the conversation with Nicodemus. It's only in John that took place in the first year of Jesus' ministry. John chapter 4, the woman at the well, not in any of the other gospels. John chapter 5, blind man gets healed, guy at the pool comes, and, and he said, Jesus said, but, uh, do you want to get well? He said, yeah, I do. Well, John chapter 6, the feeding of the 5,000. That's not in any of the other Gospels. So it's all in the Gospels of John. Uh, the woman who's caught in adultery, that's in John. And so he writes about the first two years of Jesus' ministry particularly. But this truth is in all four of the Gospels. That's amazing to me. Uh, I'll tell you why it's important in a minute, but I want to show it to you in the Scripture. Matthew 3.11, we've already read where John the Baptist said, The one's coming after me is mightier than I. He'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And there was some fire, you remember, on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Ghost came in fullness. Mark chapter 1, verse 8. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Luke 3, 16. John answered saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to lose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John 1, 33, John says, I didn't know him, but he who sent me, who sent John, it was the Father. He who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. When Jesus was baptized for the first time, the Holy Spirit settled on an individual and remained. Before that, when the Holy Spirit would come, he would come on a person for a particular ministry, then he was gone. And then when another thing needed to happen, he would show up again. But he remained on Jesus. I'm glad he remains today, aren't you? Oh, hallelujah. He comes, he settles down and makes himself at home in our heart. Our body becomes his temple and we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Wonderful, 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 wonderful. Well, hallelujah. Bless my soul. Uh, three New Testament baptisms. Now, three words. The rest of the message is going to center around these three words. Salvation, water, and spirit. I want you to see that that is a pattern all through the New Testament. That's the way these spiritual experiences happen. They start with salvation, then there was water baptism, then there was spirit baptism. And all of them, you'll see it in the book of Acts, all of them follow that pattern except when the Gentiles in uh, Acts 10 were, were that, that they, they were filled first and then were baptized after that. But Gentiles always get it mixed up anyway. But this was the pattern. <laughs> this was the pattern of the, the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. This was the day of Pentecost, by the way, or uh, when, when the Holy Spirit was poured out, remember? And Peter had been told to wait for the promise of the Father to come. And keep that in the back of your mind. Now wait for the promise, the promise to come. And then Peter, as he stands up and preaches, the people say, well, how can this happen for us? What's happened to you all that were filled with the Holy Spirit? Now notice they're asking about how to be filled with the Spirit. They're not asking about how to be saved. Paul and Silas told the Philippian jailer, what you need to do to be saved is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. These people are talking about how to have happen to us what's happened to you all. And so they said, what are we supposed to do? Peter said, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He says, repent, be baptized. Notice that order. It's there, clear as it can be. Salvation, water, and spirit. And he's talking about the promise being fulfilled. If you go back 
uh, or verse 39, I didn't put that in here, but Peter then says, the promise, the promise of what? Promise of the Holy Spirit. He says, the promise is to you and to your children <laughs> and all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall. I get in on that. I'm a part of that all. So it's for us, not just for the 12, not just for the 120, but it's for as many as the Lord our God shall call. That's better than your responding this morning. That's good. That's good. Repent. Be baptized. That's the order. Salvation deals with repentance. Water is baptism and the filling of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's the order. Okay, let me show you another. Acts chapter 8, verse 12. Philip is going, uh, a layman, a deacon in the church. He goes to Samaria and he preaches the things concerning the kingdom of God. Now notice, when they believed that's how you get saved, is believe on the Lord Jesus. When they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of the God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Well, that's all you need, right? Well, as if you read your Bible, that wasn't all that happened there. Acts 8, verse 14, when the apostles who were still in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God. They sent Peter and John to them who, when they had come down, said, well, here, my brother, let me give you the right hand of fellowship. That's all you need. No, that's not what your Bible says. Not what my Bible says. It says when they had come down, they prayed for them. Why? That they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet he had fallen, he had not immersed, he had not come with fullness upon any of them. And they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then, get this, they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Do you see it? Salvation, water baptism, the reception of the Holy Spirit. It's there. It's clear all through the scripture. Well, Acts 19, let me give you another. And it happened. Don't you like that word? It happened. When I was reading that this morning, looking over my notes, I said, Lord, let something happen in Ro Oak Grove today. When the Holy Ghost shows up, things happen. Amen? Amen. And this is a happening place because the Holy Spirit abides here in the hearts and minds of his people. And it happened. Oh, I love it. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper region, came to Ephesus and finding some what? Disciples. disciples. If the Bible calls them disciples, we probably ought to believe that. Would you agree? Yes. Call them disciples. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Ah, oh, what a question. That's something you need to deal with, something I've got to deal with. Did you receive the endowment of the Holy Spirit's power when you believe? He put you in the body of Christ, but did you receive him? That's what Paul is asking here. Well, notice their answer. They probably went to the same church I did growing up. They said, we've not so much as heard <laughs> whether there be a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, that, well, Go check out their salvation now. And then what were you baptized? And they said into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance. He told you how to get saved. Saying to the people that they should believe on him who was to come after him. That's Jesus. That is on Christ. He makes it so clear that you have to believe on Christ to be saved. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Paul laid his hands on them and the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. Same thing that happened on the day of Pentecost. Salvation, water, and spirit. So clear. You see it? Yes. Talk to me. Give, give me some feedback. Are you seeing it? Yes. I don't want you to sit up here and chatter this morning. I want to communicate. I want you to grab on what I'm saying. Yes. There are three New Testament baptisms. There's baptism into the body of Christ. There's baptism in water. And then there's the baptism 
in the Holy Spirit, okay? Now, let me give you another scripture. I give you Acts. There are four times it's mentioned in Acts, and all of them follow that pattern. Now, one other thing before I leave that, you need to know this. Sumerians, when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, was five years after Pentecost. So five years after Pentecost, the disciples are still teaching people, not only do you need to be saved, water baptized, but you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 10, where we didn't have time to read, where the Gentiles were filled with the Holy Spirit was 10 years. And 10 years after Pentecost, they're still teaching people as a disciple, the follower of the Lord, you need to be saved, you need to be water baptized, you need to have that old life cut off, and then you need to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to live a fruitful Christian life. Well, Acts chapter 19, are you ready for this? Was 25 years after Pentecost. And Paul says, you need to know that you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. The promise is not just to the 120. It's to you and to your children and all that are for all. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. It's for us. Now, 1 John 5, verse 7. I want you to see this is not only just in the book of Acts. If it was there, it'd be enough by itself. But this pattern is here in 1 John. 1 John 5, 7 says, For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. Now, the Word is who? That's Jesus, right? Revelation 19 says Jesus is the Word. John 1 says that the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory as of the Father, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Word is Jesus. So he says now these three bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. These three are one. We believe that. I think everybody here believes in the Trinity, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, what do they bear witness to? Since they bear witness, they bear witness in heaven. What do they bear witness to? They bear witness to the supernatural. You are more than flesh and blood. You're more than a dog. And when you die, there'll be a part of you that'll live on forever. You are uh, enveloped in this body of clay, there is in that, there is the soul that God has given you and he's breathed into our soul the breath of life. And we are more than just a human hunk of clay. We are something for God. We are. Uh, Paul says, by grace we're saved and then God, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We, and, and the Greek word there is poema. We are God's poetry. We're God's poem. His thing of beauty. You are God's workmanship. You are God's poem. You are God's thing of beauty. And God never makes junk. <laughs> Woo! Oh, wow. None of that was in my notes for the morning, but it is good. Mm. These three witness in heaven. But now notice verse 8. I love it. See if you see these three baptisms in the next verse of Scripture. Now, before I say that, Sometimes salvation is referred to as repentance and believing. Sometimes it's referred to as being washed in the blood. We know that. Jesus was the Lamb of God, and his blood takes away sin, right? So sometimes salvation is referred to as blood. Now look at verse 8. And these three that bear witness on earth, the spirit, the water, and the blood, And these three agree as one. You see it? The supernatural. They bear witness to the supernatural. Look, when I got saved, 
over here when I was put into the body of Christ. The supernatural bore witness to my spirit that I was a child of God. When I got baptized in water, there was a change. There was a dynamic that happened. The old life was cut off. And then in 1970, when I got filled with the Holy Ghost, He came again and witnessed to my heart. And I knew beyond a shadow of doubt that the Holy Spirit had filled me. His Spirit whoo, run all over me. And I knew He had filled me with His Spirit. Amen. So do you see it? Now, one last illustration, and I'm done this morning. In the Old Testament, God told Moses to build a tabernacle. And Moses was caught up in a vision, I'm sure, to heaven. And God gave him the picture of the tabernacle and told him how to, de how to design it and everything. Now, I draw a picture of that, so I, I hope you can understand it this morning. I draw it with my computer because you couldn't have f figured it out at all if you have followed it the way I draw. Cause I write like a doctor, I, you know. Anyway, uh, Moses' tabernacle, this is simple form of Moses' tabernacle. And... It was an outer court, and there was the inner court. And in the inner court, it was divided in two between the holy place and the holy of holies. Now, that's where the Shekinah of glory hovered over the tabernacle, that cloud that had led them all the way. Remember, when they would stop, that cloud would come and just hover, and God dwelt between the wings of that cherubim that was in the Holy of Holies. And once a year, the high priest wanted to get into the presence where the presence of God was. The New Testament tells us that the veil had been taken away and God has made us royal priests. And now we can come into that very presence of God. Now, I want you to notice this. To get into the presence of God, there were three things that priest had to deal with. Now, uh, and by the way, I put an arrow there. I hope you can see the arrow. There was just one way in. <laughs> There's just one cornerstone, folks. We sang about him this morning. There's just one door and only one. And yet it's sides are two. I'm on the inside. How about you? Oh, okay. I took too much fun this morning. Inside, before you could get to the holy place and the holy of holies, where the presence of God was, you had to come by the altar. And what happened at the altar? Well, there was a lamb that was slain, blood that was slain there. What does that remind you of? Salvation. The blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God, washes away my sin. Well, that wasn't enough. There was a laver that was there. And the laver was a silver thing, that, or a brass thing that was there. It was filled with water. What would that be? Baptism. Water baptism. And then there was a third thing. There was a flask of oil. And before you could get into the holy place, that high priest... Before he could get in there, he had to have somebody pour oil on him. And he literally poured oil all over him. Now, let me, let, me, let me show you something else. Those three things all correspond to salvation, water, and the Spirit. And so if you wanted to get into the presence of God, now follow me. This is getting deep. If you wanted to get into where God's presence was... You couldn't bypass the blood, you couldn't bypass the water, and you couldn't bypass the oil. But, and so if that happened, all you had to do, you could just go sailing right on into the presence of God. But here's the problem. Here's what some folks have done today. We've said, well, I, I, I hear the, the blood preached, and I, I'm saved, and I believe that. And uh, I'll get baptized, you know, if the water is hot in the baptistry and if, or in June or July, you know, I'll get baptized then. But uh, I don't know about that weird 
being baptized in the Holy Spirit. So here's what some folks have tried to do. They try to bypass the filling, the baptism of the Spirit. Now, you know your Bible here at Oak Grove. What happened if you went in not totally prepared into the holy place? They tied a rope on the priest, they said, so they could drag them out if they died. We got a whole lot of folks that are walking around today who are lifeless. They have no power. They're in the church. They've been baptized. They've been, they've, they've been in the, put in the body of Christ. They've been put under the water, but they've tried to bypass the filling of the Holy Spirit. And you will never, never, never have the power of the Holy Spirit in your life until you let him immerse you, until you let Jesus fill you with the Holy Spirit. But the good news is <laughs> you can be immersed in the Holy Spirit. This is he that was the promise of the Father. And it is for you. And it is for your children. And it is for me and all that are far off. As many as the Lord our God shall call. Have you been called the salvation? Have you been water baptized? Then you are a candidate yes. for the filling Amen. of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Whew. Lord, where do I go? All right. I want you to get in. So let me do this. Let me go back to point three. Jesus is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And every one of us here, if you're a believer, you are somebody Jesus wants to immerse in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And it's not weird. It's not strange. And please, listen, I, I'm going I'm to pray for you in just a moment for you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus is going to fill. Some of you here this morning, you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit. You're saved. You've been water baptized, but you've never been filled. And he's going to fill you this morning. I, I know that. He, he told me that this morning. There are going to be several folks that's going to be filled today at Oak Grove. But listen to me. You've got to surrender yourself for the filling. Just like you became a candidate for water baptism and you said, preacher, I want to be baptized in water. You need to come before Jesus and say, Jesus, baptize me in the Holy Spirit. It's not strange. It's not weird. And listen, I'm not going to, I'm not going to suggest that you be, uh, that you, I'm not going to ask the Lord cause you talk in tongues or anything like that. I'm not talking about one of the gifts of the Spirit. I'm talking about the giver of all of the gifts, the Holy Spirit. And he will give you whatever gifts he sees you need to serve him in the body. Amen? Amen. All of us clear there? Okay. Now, here's what we're going to do this morning. I'm going to ask you if you'd like to be filled. You've been saved. You've been water baptized but you're not filled. You say, well, I, I, I've resisted it for years. Well, I understand. I did too because I didn't understand. And maybe this morning you recognize it's not something strange, it's not something weird, but it's something the Holy, the, the, that God wants to do for you to fill you. And so you want to submit yourself to him for filling. Now here's what I want us to do. I'm going to ask you if you want to be filled just to stand up where you are. Just stand up and remain standing. Just stand up. Stand up. Now, I want to say this. Oh, waves of glory. I want to say this to you. Now, listen. You get filled the same way you get saved. It's by grace through faith. It's a gift of God. And you get saved the same way. Faith comes by what? Hearing. hearing. And hearing by the word of God. I've given you the word this morning and showed you in the scriptures how Jesus wants to fill you with the Holy Spirit. So now what do we need to do? We just need to ask him to fill us. And maybe some of you have been filled before. 
You maybe you need to have a refilling take place. David said, I want to be anointed with fresh oil. <laughs> well, there's one initial filling, but there can be many refillings along the way. And this is wonderful. Oh, this is wonderful. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your hands, not hold them up high, but just put them out in front of you. And, and, and I want you to do this. Now, nothing's going to happen. Nothing's Nothing weird's going to happen. Nothing's going to come into your hands. But I, I just want you to put your hands out to say in a bodily uh, kind of declaration, I want to receive. In a receiving mode. Yeah. Just put your hands out in a receiving mode. Father, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed right now, oh, what a wonderful sight this is here in this place today. And Jesus, it must be wonderful to you because this is what you came for. And so, Lord, right now, I'm asking you, oh, Jesus, would you just do what you promised? Now, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I want you, where you are, in your heart, to just ask him, Jesus, fill me with your spirit. Go ahead, just ask him in your heart, Jesus, fill me with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. Now, Jesus, I'm asking you to make this real in every person's life. Lord, they're obedient. They've stood based on your word and said, I want to be filled. So Jesus, just like you filled the disciples of the 120 and that group in Samaria and that group at Ephesus, God, I'm asking in Jesus' name that you would endue with power from on high, give them the promise, the promise, Lord, of the Father. It's to them that the promise has been made. And now, Lord, would you help every person standing? Just say this to Jesus. Jesus, I receive. I receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Oh, Spirit, now would you witness in your own sweet way to every person who's standing today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something. The devil is going to lie to you. The devil's going to say nothing happened. But listen to me. Jesus said he's a liar. And the truth is not in him. I've given you the truth this morning. The word of God. And I want you to just say thank you, Father, for filling me. Woo! Glory! <laughs> Oh, goody, goody, goody. Everybody, let's say it together. Goody, goody, goody. Woo, glory. <laughs> oh, go home if you can. <laughs> You're dismissed. God bless you. Woo. <sighs>